<laughs> I love that every time we're like, we should have an intro, and they're like, okay. And then we just like slop onto the next thing. <laughs> like we don't even bother trying. Just uh Yeah, we're we're bad podcasters yeah. and we're and we're just telling on ourselves right now. <laughs> uh but you know, like in the interest of being better sure. and doing better. That'd be good. Uh welcome to Director Peace Theater. Uh I'm Abe Epperson. I'm one of your co hosts. Uh I'm joined uh by introduce yourself. Uh really. thank you. Adam Ganser, the other of your co hosts. Uh, we're different people, Abe. Were you aware of that? Yes. <laughs> um, not if my entire frame of reference was a comment section. <laughs> and um, you know, yeah, you know, I I think it's a little flattering. Honestly, I think it's a little flattering at times. You know, because like, uh, who wouldn't who, that you're like that they can they think you're me? Yeah, well, who or I'm who, you? Well, I mean, who wouldn't want to sound like me? <laughs> I love this. You thought a compliment was coming, and it didn't. You like that? Uh, it, it begins. Yeah. Yes. 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 I, li- I like our little, uh, our little spars. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Please, yeah. intro. I'm, I'm, yeah, that little tete-a-tete is just mm-hmm. a, a piece of what you get here at Director <laughs> Peace Theater, because we're two directors. We're two hotheads. We really are. We're two, uh, we have our vi- we have various opinions. Um, yeah. Just off mic a second ago, we were talking about how we're like, yeah. I guess I agree. That's fine. <laughs> like we always make it a little more contentious than it needs to That's, be. Let's yeah. let's can we agree on that? Oh. You know, like most humans will be like cordial about it. And we're like, no, yeah. I need to have my opinion right. in here. I need <laughs> why? Because I need it. Not only that, I need you to know that I have chosen to agree. I could have gone the other way. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I guess everything, gone the other way. everything is a power move. And today's power move is made by Adam. Thank you. Uh, this is an Adam episode, uh, and uh, I'm looking at an outline. Yeah, you are. It's entitled "How Michael Bay Saved Armageddon," and I, <laughs> I, I have to tell you, yeah, I can't wait to hear what you got. <laughs> you got for this one. Yeah, uh, I, I knew that was kind of so, a that was a shot across the bow for everyone's good taste. Mm-hmm. Like, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> yeah. uh, what does that mean? Let's begin. Great question. So. Uh, 1998's Armageddon. Uh, I feel like this is one of those movies pretty much everybody's seen, uh, which is weird because it's not that good of a movie, but I feel like everybody has seen it. Um, and it's, huge movie, it's a huge yeah. movie. Yeah, absolutely. In a year of, year of huge movies, actually. Um, and it has a gigantic problem as a, as a film. Uh, the problem is not the asteroid hurtling toward the Earth. It's that the movie is fundamentally about drilling. <laughs> like that's what the movie's ultimately <laughs> about. Let's drill yeah. on something, which cinematically I'm going to argue is a fundamentally boring idea. Uh, mm-hmm. And what I mean by that, like, look, I mean the perfect ki- test case for this is go watch the core. That movie never got interesting. I watched it. In, oh my God. I love the core, but, but it's not good though. Right. You can, you can no, yeah. it's not. Yeah. It's it, the core is like a spectacular. It's like watching like ski videos yes. where like the ski, like they're on, they're on, they're on their skis. They can't take off their skis. They have no power to stop. Yeah, and it just keeps happening, and they're just tumbling down yeah. the snow. That's right. It's 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 all it's fascinating. Like I want to look away, but I I can't. Right, you because you know there's a tree at the end of that video but you still need to see you know, it happen yeah their day their day is only going downhill for 100 percent. i i completely agree that is the core the core is a movie that didn't do what michael bay did for armageddon i think the core is going to be like a great proof text for everything that i have to say about what michael bay has done to make this movie work uh so bear so if you can mm-hmm. hold the core in the back of your brain as like a a good sort of like Rorschach test, if you will, about hey, why do why mm-hmm, do I like mm-hmm. this and do I not like this and why? Um, okay, so essentially, and the act of drilling, cinematically speaking, has very little drama in it. And by that I mean there's really not a lot of beats to drilling. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like you set up the drill, you drill it, and then the drill is done. Uh, so like yeah, yeah, as a way to solve a problem. It's not the most cinematically involved solution. 
Uh, mm -hmm. Like, you know, again, contrast this with any other blockbuster you've ever seen. Uh, when you drill, you don't run or gun or steal or hide or betray or discover or realize or really any other verb. It's just an, uh, you're standing around watching a machine do a job. That's the idea. So, yeah, the most the most uh, active part of it is actually seen in this movie where someone hits oil right. and then it explodes all over all yes, over everyone. Exactly. Uh, but that's like just an instantaneous like we did it. Or I guess in this movie it does this thing where it says like, and they're drilling, and they they're 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 almost at the they're number. They're almost of at feet. the number. Exactly. You're just watching. Yeah. A, you're watching. And then a they number. hit the number, and you go. Yes, yeah, we <laughs> did it. Now, I mean, all, right. I, I, all credit to the screenwriter and Michael Bay, because they had to do a lot to spice up that problem. Um, but on a fundamental mm. premise level, it's pretty flawed, right? It's pretty flawed in terms of entertainment value. I will also argue, and this I know is going to be a little more contentious, that the place we go in this movie, which is an asteroid, is also not one of the best places to be for a long extended period of time because once you get there it's a cool idea it's cool to go there as abe and i have talked about off off mic but once you get there it's basically just sort of a a, a giant ice rock you know and there's not a lot mm. to it uh abe it reminded me that uh, asteroids are fundamentally unstable because i believed going into this that like uh the unstable like the instability of the asteroid was an invention of the movie maker so I can accept on some level that maybe it's like sort of like being on a volcanic island or something, like a barren desert volcano island. Like maybe it's like yeah. that. But again, you don't want to be there for very long. It's sort of like being in Tatooine in Star Wars. It's like, look, we want to like it's fine for a little while, but get me off this desert planet. Right. It is literally screaming through space. <laughs> like it's going super. It's fast. awesome. Like, I don't it's, know. yeah, but the, there's, uh, it's, but awesome. you're not watching it streak by like it's on light speed or something. You know what I mean? Like they're literally just standing on a rock. You know what I mean? So like on, yeah, on that level, it's true on that level. It's a matter of perspective. Yeah. Like you can make it, but you're still going really fast. I mean, sure. it's true that for example, we're going like, I forget like 50,000, 50,000, uh, you know, miles per hour through space, ten thousand mi miles per hour spinning, uh, and that's a de and that's the Earth. That's you all the time. Right. Like, think about how fast we're going right now. We're going real fast. That's true. Fast, mind-boggling fast, but we don't feel it, you know, because we're used. Well, to that's it, so. that's the thing, right? And that's a, that's the exact argument I would make about being on an asteroid is that mm -hmm. even though it is like on a spreadsheet, interesting. For all those reasons, the actual experience of it is sort of just standing on a rock drilling. You know what I mean? Like, that's not the best idea. Sure. So I think that Michael Bay knows this, right? Like, he understands that that's a problem. And because of that, I'm going to make a controversial claim, which is Armageddon is actually an incredibly directed film and shows why Michael Bay became the go-to blockbuster franchise guy. Uh, because the movie should be much less interesting giving the elements. Again, the core has the same exact problems, basically. Like, the the core of the Earth is also this, like, barren, you know, hard as stone, no light place. And it sucks. But we don't see outside because we're inside That's true. The Earth. So it's, you can't see. So there's not a lot of visualization. Well, there. they have that whole scene in the core where they step out of the ridiculous drill car and, like, it's all gigantic stalactite like diamonds you know yeah which is nonsense it's nonsense I love, it. I love it too but it's boring like even though they did that to make it interesting it's still boring because there's really nothing to it it's like okay this is what it looks like and then we're kind of stuck here for a while so i'm mostly engaged in your theory but at the end of this i want to have an actual discussion about like, what makes what, it interesting what makes it what makes things interesting Hello, Cal. yeah 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 because like because uh, they're throwing diamonds at you, they're screaming through space, they're like explosions are happening, and you're like, no, no, no. This See, is I'm gonna, boring. I'm gonna, I'm gonna remove the expl <laughs> the explosions piece because that I agree is interesting, but the rest mm -hmm. of it, I totally agree that that is worth a discussion and we can have it. Uh, and the short mm -hmm. version of my answer is gonna be it's the same problem that Fallout has as a video game. Which is, it's interesting on paper, but as a thing to look at and as an execution or experience, it's not that good. And that is what Michael Bay is so great at doing, is making the experience itself okay. matter. That's the point. 
The journey. Correct. The journey. The journey. Yes. So. Gotcha. To go back, just to just to re-stick this back on my rails here. So, like, Armageddon is an incredibly directed film. It should have been a failure for a lot of reasons. Uh, instead, it was the most successful film of that year. Um, and it was the most successful film in a year where there was another asteroid film. So, like, it wasn't even the only premise like this that year. <laughs> yeah, deep in Yeah, yeah. It was, yeah. Everybody loves yeah. bringing up. It made that much more money, right? Like, so what is the secret majuste mm-hmm. here that made everybody love this film enough to see it that many times? Um, that's the question. And I would say that uh, the reason this film is successful is entirely attributable to Michael Bay. Um, he is the reason it works uh, as far as being an entertaining film. And uh, the reason why is that Michael Bay is one of the few directors who ha- has successfully, I'll say, abandoned the idea of narrative based emotions or narrative based like storytelling emotions right. and replaced them with what I'm going to call the blockbuster experience. OK, a l- most few right. filmmakers can even do this. Like there's not that many filmmakers who can do it. Um, because it flies in the face of everything you learn about film when you're in film school or when you're starting out storytelling, right? Like it requires throwing a lot of that away. And his unique talent is that Michael Bay can anticipate uh, and deliver a blockbuster spirit experience, even if the narrative uh, doesn't agree with it. Like he can give you a good movie when the story's bad. Uh, and again, movie being a movie experience. Yeah. That's his talent. Right, right, right. So, um, and I'm going to argue for this episode, not for every episode, but for this one, that his track record at the box office, which I, I'm going to say is the best way to to metrically analyze a blockbuster filmmaker, shows that Michael Bay does know what he's doing, and he is successful at it, even if when I watch his films, I don't like them on a narrative level. I think that the blockbuster experience is, he consistently delivers that. Um, that's my that's the premise for today. Are you are you are you ready, Abe? Are you strapped in? I'm I am so ready. <laughs> I got I got the drill in hand. Yeah. I'm ready to yeah. you know. You just let me know and I'll hit that death. Yeah, baby. you're gonna get those bits all lined up. Exactly right. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm your AJ. I'm your AJ. Oh, thank you. God. Oh, by the way, why mm-hmm. do they hate each other so much? Right? Because he's banging his daughter. Yeah, but also he's not that bummed about that. You know, and he's so much like Bruce Willis. Yeah. Like Ben Affleck is <laughs> yeah. like that's you know, like it's uh, Liv Tyler says it at one point. She's like, D- like you raise me around roughnecks. Why is it so confusing that you know I fell in love with one? It's be- and then she also says like you're you're everything good about me is in you. These are all nonsense total dialogue bullshit. choices but uh total bullshit but like that's the narrative and so you treat it as like that's the truth of the world that's true and that means that she's in love with her daddy right? and uh and aj is like her daddy that's like right. a young hot daddy the, <laughs> <laughs> the film is absolutely saying that uh like if you were to analyze this on like how how seriously or well crafted the story is this movie gets an f like mm-hmm. right off the bat Okay, uh, like like that story with mm-hmm. AJ and Bruce Willis is atrocious uh, because mm-hmm. he tries to kill him with a shotgun up top. Like that's the beginning of the movie, you know. Uh, but he somehow knows that it's I not going to work. Time, right? Which he I, knows it's not going to work. Well, he know like there's this uh, there's this wholesome quote unquote like you know like ah, I'm just ribbing you. Yeah, I'm shooting you with a shotgun. But ah, uh, because like the, this. This aspect I noticed this time because, like, uh, Steve Buscemi, Buscemi says at one point, like, after he shoots and there's, like, a ricochet hits his leg, yeah. Uh, yeah, Ben yeah. Affleck's leg, one of the shotgun slugs or whatever, and he's like, whoa, whoa, it's getting real now. Right. And, like, the demeanor of Bruce Willis changes. He's like, And he says something along the lines of, like, or, like, AJ says, like, it's all fun and games until someone gets shot in the leg. And it's like. Okay, so Bruce Willis was just going to shoot around him without, like, that means that this is all play acting. That means that this is, like, a bit. He's doing it as a bit. Right. And I, uh, and I just don't understand. Like, so you're not really angry? Like, what is your actual motivation? Yes. Ah, we're all having fun yes. here. You know, it's like, I don't, that none of this makes sense. That's right. Sense, so what you've done is you've perfectly explained 
the cognitive dissonance that exists with a blockbuster experience. Yeah. You've perfectly explained it. Yeah, Michael Bay. Yeah, because Michael Bay robot only yeah. shots, no well, emotions. No, no, yeah. he gives you emotions. They just don't line up with what with your story sense. So, like, you are still like, holy shit, he's shooting at this guy. You still get like a little bit of that adrenaline, blood pumping stuff. But it right. doesn't really it's add like up, read- and it doesn't matter that it doesn't add up because you had the experience. It's like the movie it's like had- wants you to know yeah. it's a movie. That's the thing. The movie wants you to like, no, 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 it's a movie. It's a movie. It continues to push you at a distance and say, it's not a real story, a distance, it's a movie, yeah. and like experience it only on that level. And to me, that's the essence of the blockbuster experience. You, you perfectly communicated it. Uh, so thank I, you. I really do believe that Michael Bay like read a like cliff notes of emotions, and he's like, <laughs> okay, got it. That's the topic sentence. That's how it of works. Jealousy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, he definitely analyzes things on the most surface level there is, uh, which is why mm. he makes movies that are for the masses because they are uh, they are not emotionally deep. Uh, but he does know how mm. to masterfully communicate those shallow emotions. Like he knows how to manipulate yes. you with a shot to communicate him. So the technique on display is incredible, which I'm sure Absolutely. you're going to talk more about is yes. impressive. He he is a master of that. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that. Thank you. So let me just say up top, I mean, or you know, early on here, that I do not think that Michael Bay is the best filmmaker, even for blockbusters. Like I, there are many filmmakers mm. I prefer. For blockbusters, okay. so like, like I'll, I'll list a few: Spielberg for sure, uh, Chris Nolan, mm-hmm. uh, even John McTiernan, who Abe has a boy crush on. Ooh. You love McTiernan, Ooh. yeah, baby. <laughs> you love him. Also, Ooh. I like Roland Emmerich quite a bit. Uh, I was in the theater for that. Gen- I think, please, please. I think they're well. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I agree with you. Uh, I think that they're. Cut from the same cloth, a little bit. Roland They're Emmerich closer. and Michael Bay. Roland Emmerich. Uh, I think Michael Bay is procedurally more impressive, but Roland Emmerich does the same he stuff. He does the same stuff. He is a little less willing to totally throw the story out the window. Like I just think Roland Emmerich's sensibility is wacky in the same way. He does seem to have hangouts. Yeah. Like he's like I won't do yeah. that. And Michael Bay is like I'll fucking do anything. I don't Yeah, give Michael a Bay shit. is not doesn't feel any need to tell a story that is emotionally resonant at all. He doesn't God, feel any his, need to do that, you know? Uh if you ever want to hear like just a psych a sociopath at the top of their game, DVD commentaries of Michael Bay on any of mm-hmm. his movies. It's spectacular. Mm-hmm. He he he's so workmanlike. He's just like this is where this happened. Right. <laughs> and this was interesting. And it's all about making him feel big. Yeah, he, he's like and then I his, did that, which is the only time anyone has ever done that. I was the one who did that. His uh he's the psycho. Well, he's he's got a he he has a big hole he's trying to fill. You know what I mean? Like uh that's mm-hmm. that's the That's true. That's the problem. For that's that poor true. man, uh, and I'm not here to judge him. I'm just telling you, I'm not here what to he's judge good him. at. But why'd you say Martha? <laughs> why'd you say Martha? Why'd you say Martha? He didn't even direct that film, but it's still the Michael Bay problem. Yeah. Like, if we want to talk, you know, we're talking about Michael Bay problems. Let's be honest. That's the you real are Bay problem. you are 100 percent permitted throughout this whole episode to constantly Thank bring you. up michael bay's problems because i i'm not I, like honestly i like i'm not here to defend the man but i do th- there's not i yeah. do think that we've gone to a point where we've forgotten what he's good at um and that's that's, that's what i uh, want to do yeah, this episode is like fair. show you what makes him so good because he really is very good like uh yeah he, yeah, yeah yeah i i kind of agree with yeah. you you know or you so know, yeah continue thank sir. you i my argument here is that michael bay's unique talent is that he's able to deliver a satisfying experience despite the narrative which most of my favorite blockbuster filmmakers either couldn't do or would not try to do right like that that's that's yeah, one of the things that makes him stand out so all that said michael bay's problem as the director of armageddon is as preposterous as the premise of the movie and the setting and he has to find a way to give you the experience with these elements. And so the question is, so what does he do? How does he manage this so that we get this, you know, epic film? Right. Also, by the way, it's super fucking long, which should also be a problem, but he manages to make that work. 
Um, so yeah, the is. first thing is, and this is like a little esoteric, but like stick with me on it. Michael Bay establishes right up top that the tone of the film is based entirely on the filmmaking elements and not the story. Like, that's the first thing that he does, and he's consistent with it across the board. Here's some evidence for that. So Mm -hmm. the very first thing in the film is a shot of Earth with voiceover, a thing that never shows up again, Mm -hmm. voiceover. I did too. It's very stupid. That explains how the dinosaurs were destroyed by an asteroid. And you get these really cool shots of Earth, like, oh, yeah. And then, like, you're watching a big blow up, (laughs) and the feeling, the vibe of it is awesome. We're fucking blowing up Earth, right? Which is the opposite of how you should feel. That's the opposite of how you're supposed to feel about that event if you live on Earth, which we all do. So, like, he is already. Be, be, like based on music and titles and the way he's shooting it, he's uh, subverting the narrative element to make you feel like, yeah, man, we're fucking doing it. That's true. And yeah, yeah, he understands his. He assignment, really does. I guess that he gave. Himself, That's right. That he gave him. And bear in mind, he's going to ask you to feel every single way you possibly could about the destruction of Earth in the course of this film. He's going to ask you to feel patriotic, right. like my God, the American flags in this film. Uh, he, he's oh, going to ask you to like sing Kumbaya with other people as the earth is about to be destroyed. He's going to ask you to like, look at the look mm. sadly on these people who lived here and lost their lives. Like he has no sense of like, it doesn't matter what I said three minutes ago. We're saying this now about it and he can make you feel that way. And it's incredible. Right. And it's purely There's an amazing line on this topic. Now that you mention it, there's a line that I remember, which is that when the president is giving his speech uh-huh. about yep. like these 14 men who are going <laughs> to give their lives, you know, he says like, and all of the all of the uh, ingenuity and progress and where we are as a society has led us to this moment where we can fight back for the first time ever. And he goes like, even our wars have led us here. <laughs> it's like one of my favorite lines now, just because it's like, uh, it's leave it to like the old, like a uh, fucking president to be like, by the way, skirt this under the rug. Remember all those war we did? Yeah. That also were kind good. of made us who <laughs> yeah, we those are. Those are good. <laughs> they're good. Wars, are, wars good are good, aren't they? Because they'll save the you world. You like blow ups. Right? Uh, anyway. Yeah. yeah. Like, so. I mean, yeah, so right away he establishes that tone, right? Now, as you right. said perfectly, and I think it's consistent across the film, uh, Michael Bay will not let you forget that this is a movie. Okay, like that that's he will never let you forget it's a movie. He requires you to keep that fact present in your mind to enjoy it. And so because of that, he will ask you to root for the calamity that's going to happen to Earth, and then later on to be terrified yeah. about that. Or because of that, that's he'll he'll say like, "Let's have Bruce Willis try to shoot Ben Affleck completely irresponsibly." Um, but then, like you know, by the end of the film, they're brothers in arms, saving each other's lives, and that isn't ridiculous. Mm-hmm. You know, like it, all those right. things can be <laughs> true at once, right? It's very like right. it's like Derrida or something. It's 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 fucking amazing, really. Um, yeah, it's a cartoon. Yeah, that's yeah, what it is. right. So that's one of the first tactics, and he's going to use it all the time, and it makes us stop criticizing the story. Okay, because like that's and that's the key ingredient. It makes us stop criticizing the story. So another thing that he does is he will inc- he'll create impossible leaps of time and logic to keep us interested in what's going on. Okay, so for instance. Harry, that's Bruce Willis' character, is escorted by a helicopter to NASA. Like, they, they go to his oil rig at mm-hmm. the top of the movie, and then they're like, okay, we have 18 hours, we get him to NASA, where he, and then he's going to insist on bringing his own crew. Okay, now, so, just timeline-wise, they were working on an oil rig out at sea less than 48 hours ago, by the time they're rounding yeah. him up, okay? So, right. now, also, this is just an aside, but it's got to be said, it is so dumb that we are that NASA is training drillers to go to space, then like it's so much dumber for that to be happening than for drillers to be training astronauts. But there's I wanna there's yeah, a, this is a, I, I have an X to grant on as this. As you one. should. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And this is what Ben famously yes, Ben did. Affleck says this in the DVD commentary. 
And I think everyone listening to this probably has already heard that it's great. If you haven't, it's a YouTube video. It's like two minutes long. Or watch the DVD commentary to Armageddon if you have it. Um, but he says that, and I was looking down the comments uh, recently. It probably wasn't, it wasn't even this time, but like in the past I read it. And I was like, yeah, which is that they're like, yeah, I hear this argument all the time, but it's not like they're training them to be astronauts. They're training them to be passengers. Like it's not. That's the argument. It's, I mean, that's honestly, they never say like, they literally say in the movie, it's like, uh, they're like to be, yeah, to like, you're train you're doing all this so we can play at astronaut. And like the actual astronaut says, no, you just have to sit there until like the drilling happens. And he's like, okay, if I'm only, so if we're not doing any of the astronaut stuff, uh, we'll accept, we accept, uh, you know, like, so they did actually in the movie it's point a that out. I'm, I'm not defending the movies. You're absolutely right that like, it's not that hard to drill. It's a completely the, meaningless distinction. That is a completely it's meaningless, a completely distinction. meaningless distinction, but it's also in once again, as you're arguing in the consistent nonsense logic of the movie, it is like, it's 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 there. It's it it it's consistent. Right. I guess it's it's with all the rest. So of the shit. I, I mean, <laughs> we all know that. Like, every, like I don't think we need to convince anybody that this plan makes sense. I think we all fucking know it doesn't make sense. But but what it's, we should be yeah. asking is, why then are we sending drillers to space instead of astronauts? Like, what's what is that decision? And the answer is that it's it's mm-hmm. literally magician sleight of hand stuff to keep this movie interesting. Mm-hmm. It's more interesting for yeah. dummies to be in space yeah, see the writing. than it is for yeah. really good astronauts who are good at their job to be in space because astronauts who are good at their job will do it efficiently without drama. That's the problem. Mm-hmm. So having mm-hmm. dummies mm-hmm. in space is like things are going to go wrong. That's the whole idea. So anyway, I want to get back to this timeline because like, it's unbelievable. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Harry gets escorted to NASA and then in 48 <laughs> hours, they decide they're going to round up these other drillers. Here, so we get a very long yeah. montage, a long montage. It's the best. Where they, it's it is the, the best. best. Here's the things that happened in those 48 hours, just logically. Okay, yes. so Ben Affleck's character, AJ, has started a new business. It started an entire mm-hmm. drilling business with a sign That's that right. other people... <laughs> he's got a sign, <laughs> yeah, he's the founder yeah. or president In 48 or hours that people are like, hey, you know, I don't need you anymore, Harry. He just started it. Hey, man, salt of the earth moves <laughs> fast. <laughs> Michael Clark Duncan's character, who... I, it was hard for me to tell exactly what his name was. I saw it as Bear... Papa Bear. Okay, I'll, I'll accept yeah. Papa Bear. I think it was also J. Otis was his real name, but it's fine. Papa Bear. Uh, he traveled to the Midwest and gets in a high-speed motorcycle chase with the FBI. Could you do it? Mm-hmm. You could do it, but you'd have to really decide that's what you're going to do in the next 48 hours. <laughs> that's mm-hmm. the first thing. Mm-hmm. So, like, uh, I guess like it's sort of more importantly about this montage, aside from the fact that they're like all over God's green earth, which is impossible. None of them have a single patriotic bone in their body. Not one. Right? Like, so they like they don't want to help Uncle Sam. Hey they're not now. interested. But they're not. Like, they're, they're, it's. They may not want to pay taxes, but the patriotism, it's in there, man. Uh, wait, it's wait, in wait, the wait, 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 wait. Because this is actually worth contending about. I agree that, like, <laughs> I agree that, you know, maybe it's down deep in your heart. But realistically, if you know that planet Earth is about to be destroyed by an asteroid, and, and so everyone's going to die. And you alone can help fix that. This kind of behavior, mm-hmm. this fucking junior high bullshit, is not only mm-hmm. like not only is it amoral, like immoral. It's also like definitely not patriotic. You're, like you don't care about your country or your fellow humanity. You're a mercenary monster. You know, like that's just a fact. Uh, <sighs> So yeah. that's what but we're I saying mean, about their characters. But it doesn't matter because it's funnier that they're doing this. It's more fun that they're doing That's this. That's the thing. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't matter. They don't have to be patriotic. Right. I mean, it's just the it's the thing that Michael Bay likes, I guess. Right, but you like you it know? too. It's like he wants people to salute. There's at the end of the film, right? After Bruce Willis dies, <laughs> right? And he and uh what's his face goes up, like the astronaut yeah. goes up to Liv Tyler and is like, I, I would like to shake your hand. Yeah, him. Yeah. And he says his rank and name right 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 like he's he's saluting a you know 
four star yeah, Colonel general. Space Boy. He's I just want to shake the hand of the most brave man I've ever met. And uh and it's like it's it's patriotism for that that's the the single thread of emotion that is garnered from that moment. That's what patriot that's what patriotism means to me. That's Michael what it means Bay, to Michael Bay, correct. Is honor correct. and trust. Correct. It does not matter about nations, but you know that works just as well for Michael Bay, the robot monster. Right. Uh, well, so that's what he uses in his uh, films, right? No, Am you're I not wrong, wrong but I will argue that he does know enough about how patriotism actually works to know how to successfully ah, yes. invoke it elsewhere. Like, yeah, yeah. Hence the monster. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> like, that's the thing is, like, these character, these characters need to be patriotic and sort of like humanistic and all these things by the end because uh that's what the movie needs us to experience like that's part of the blockbuster experience right right. but he also like and they don't grow by the way none of these fucking people grow at all uh maybe harry grows like a little bit but none of them grow a little but like so literally they're just having an experience that (laughs) <laughs> I, and by the way, when we say grow, sorry, I just want to throw this in. Let's return back to when he sees like his growth, I guess, would be that he's OK now with Ben Affleck doing his daughter. <laughs> like he's not being hung up on the yeah, th- yeah, idea yeah. of Liv Tyler yeah, yeah, making yeah. her own choices yeah. as a dad. Uh, and one, let's be clear about what makes him, what allows him to be OK with that. The fact that he realizes that Ben Affleck is just like him. Right. So in other words, it's a right. self-fulfilling it's prophecy. Narcissism. Uh, it's narcissism. Yeah, so it's very ridiculous. dumb. So like, again, it, this is us analyzing it from a story point of view, right? But the film right. finds a way because he's so slippery <laughs> to, like that you'd never really yeah. analyze this and you just sort of let it happen to you. And it, so... You just go, fuck it. Yeah. <laughs> right. So just again, <laughs> I just want to get back on this point. So this leap of time, the other interesting thing about it is that these guys all knew that Harry was going with NASA for a problem. And they're not interested in what that problem is. Like, none of them check in on him. None of them find... Like, so this behavior of, like, going on this weird rampage requiring a roundup and then acting like depressed middle schoolers during the NASA, NASA training is not only fundamentally illogical... It's uh, it's emotionally like antithetical to how anybody would act. Like nobody would act like this. You know what I mean? Like yeah. people, you, no, you wouldn't. Would. Nobody would act yeah, like yeah. this. But it doesn't matter because it gets us to the point where we're ready for a space mission, and we're having a good time the entire time. So you, so like, don't take the threat to Earth that seriously, right? Like during this mm-hmm. section, are we taking the asteroid that seriously? I'm gonna say no. Why? Because Michael Bay wants to play that string right now. So that's what he does. He creates a whole sequence that gives us a fun action movie training montage. But he knows because of the premise, he's got to make it stupid. Because if he takes it seriously, we're going to be like, this is not. This this is is really bad. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Like the core. Exactly. Because like, again, because he makes it more fun, you don't criticize the story. Right. So you don't think you don't think about the premise. My favorite counterpoint to this you know, because again, this is an hour of the movie, this training montage. Like, it's a really long mm-hmm. period of time. Mm-hmm. They get to space an hour it's, and ten minutes. Which is a movie, really long time. That's like the midpoint of the yeah. movie. It's very long. So, mm-hmm. my favorite counterpoint to this is the movie Inception. Because Inception also mm-hmm. has a really, uh, a really complex premise that needs a lot of exposition and training to explain it. But see, Chris Nolan refuses to give us a buddy montage or make a bunch of wisecracks. He wants to really deep dive into the premise. So how does he do it? He Mm. does your sort of classic, let's train the newbie. He wants us to evaluate the premise, right? That's what he wants. He wants to explain and evaluate the premise. And so to do that, he does your sort of classic train the newbie with Elliot page where they go uh, through all the pieces of this is how inception works. And then this is what, what it means to drop into the dreaming and all this stuff. And to learn all that stuff, you end up, evaluating does this world make sense on a level you never do for a michael bay film right Right. you kind of see uh fresh eyes on it 
Bay doesn't give a shit. <laughs> no, Bay <laughs> doesn't, doesn't care. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He doesn't care. Like you need and, no identity character. It's just uh, all things happening at once. <laughs> I mean, it might also be because Bay doesn't. Bay can't stand up to the criticism in the same way that Chris Nolan can. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that's like a character quality for him. Right, but for right. real, like uh, I think Michael Bay wisely sort of like slight sleight of hands those problems so you don't think about them. Whereas Christopher Nolan right or wrong, is confident about his premise so much so that he's like, now think about this thing I've made, you know? Mm-hmm. And like for me, with Inception, that is not a successful endeavor because I get very like torn up by little things. Mm-hmm. Uh, but not everybody will agree with that. So, you know, that's fine. That's a uh, difference yes. in tactic, right? And, uh, mm-hmm. and I think that's interesting. Michael Bay is one of the only filmmakers who would even do that. So the point is, these compromises not only do they take our mind off the story and put it on the movie experience, but they also give Michael Bay a different set of tools to use to convey meaning to us. Okay. So because we're no longer focused on the story beats now, uh, we're thinking more about sort of his storytelling conventions. Like we're having a more surfacey experience of this narrative and Michael Bay capitalizes on that with like some really key filmmaking tools. One of them is gigantic close-ups massive <laughs> close-ups okay like like he will slam you with most of a person's face anytime he wants you to have a feeling yeah you know and like, I, usually I dolly in to it yes yes yeah. like so like these are aggressive filmmaking tactics right mm-hmm. uh they're loud and they're distracting um, but they're not distracting like I'm having a bad experience they're distracting like oh I have to feel this because it's such a loud choice like I'm I'm zeroed in on that right and he will also change tones with a cut. Like he does this all the time. It's a serious moment. Then he undercuts it with a joke. And how does he get away with that? By smashing into a close up. Right. And you sort of stick with him because of the intensity of that decision. Right. Like mm-hmm. he's he uses editing and close ups to and and camera moves that basically like he refuses to let you sort of have a gentle transition. He has no gentle transitions at all. Okay, he's like jamming you in new tones all the time, and like it works because they're such aggressive moves. Um, by the way, I've so like I've argued that in another episode with the Chris Nolan one on Dark Knight, mm-hmm. that uh, I've argued that Chris Nolan kind of uses the steady cam to sort of lull you into a sort of pass as a, to be a passive watcher. Mm-hmm. You know, that was the thing we talked about last time. Yeah. I think Michael Bay goes even further with that. Um, because Nolan has kind of a single speed, right? Like he has, as you said, he has like a, like a constant, like we're kind of washing into the yeah. next scene, then into the and next And you're one. right. His velocity is that of an observer or a watcher, someone who's like creeping into the <clears throat> drama. Uh, Michael Bay feels like he's just a sledgehammer. He's like, look at yes. this shit. <laughs> yes. Yes. And like, but he does it very art. Like he never does it in a way that you think about it. Right. Instead, what he does is he, but he, he takes such aggressive controlling moves of the visuals and the tone that y- you are not really able to fight him on it. Mm-hmm. You know, like you have to, like you have to have a deeply analytical point of view to be fighting him on this. Cause it's really a- intense. Okay. Right. Um, also, I mean, this is another tactic that seems very absurd, but he, he gets away with it. Um, he, his lighting schemes, his lighting schemes are not only incredibly intense, like, like shadows everywhere and under lighting and all kinds of stuff. Not only that, but they are, they are the most tone. They're like tone racked up to a hundred. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, and like they often contradict within the space of a single location. So for instance, NASA, NASA and space are like, they have all kinds of jagged neon underlighting, a thing that would not really exist. Why would anybody want that? <laughs> um, and there are scenes where Billy Bob Thornton, for instance, he'll be lit normally and, and giving us like, you know, here's the information we need about what's going on with the asteroid. And then uh, he'll be getting a warning from somebody else in the same space who's got a, like he's soaked in red light, like he's in a German nightclub. Right. <laughs> and, and you're and you're never like you're never like wait a minute where does this what light is that come from space yeah you know no it, yeah he uh, it's color he fucks with color a lot there's reds yes, greens he does. blues it's all over the place uh, in this movie but it's not like enough for you to go like that is the color of this film like if you watch like alien you're like oh green is the color of this film it's not like he's doing a palette he's just a, it's just a um his palette is all color 
and he's throwing all of them at you at different times. So he puts on different hats. It's so uh, yep. what's amazing also is that because you're talking about speed here and you're talking about the ramping. I was trying to watch this time to see, like, when does he slow down? And uh, like, I noticed that there's only a few times he really slows down. And that is like, obviously he uses slow-mo for like, you know, the astronauts like walking up and like the, the brum brum right. of the orchestra. And you're so supposed to yes, feel he patriotic. Does. He also does it with the Americana and like the world shots. Like, so they, they filmed like two months before they actually shot the movie. They went all around the globe and just like, Oh, we're just going to go to, you know, we're just going to go to Hungary. We're just going to go to India. We're just going to go, you know, in this random spot and just get shots of people doing people stuff. Um, and they all look like, uh, like beer commercials. Um, and they're all shot with this kind of like slow motion. And I think it's because like to him, yeah, when you want to be solemn and serious and heartfelt, that's slow everything else is fast it seems uh i still haven't ha- found the unified huh. bay theory but like it's seen it's it's getting there it's getting there that's uh, interesting i i i dig that observation i think that's really interesting uh so as a preface to this next point i want to revisit this thing that you were talking about with ben affleck's commentary mm-hmm. so ben affleck went to michael bay if you haven't heard this section that mike that abe was referencing before Ben, ben Affleck went to Michael Bay and said, "Why don't the, why don't we have the drillers teaching the astronauts to drill in space instead of the astronauts training the drillers to be astronauts?" And Michael Bay's response was, "Shut the fuck up." That was his yeah, response that's to that, right? That's, Which it's is perfect. It's perfect. Yeah, it is perfect because uh, it tells you how Michael Bay is going to respond to uh, logic or. Uh, or analytical problems is he's gonna he's gonna up the aggression or up the intensity to ten and you're gonna like back off right that's how he manages that not only as a human being but as a director too okay so like for instance as you were saying Bay is like Bay uses speed and movement to increase the tension in scenes even if we don't know exactly what is dangerous or where physically the problem is coming from, he's still using these tactics to create those feelings, right? So examples. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's a bunch of times in this movie when things go wrong and we have no idea why. I think the best one is on the space station that they dock with. Shit goes wrong there and it's like, why did all that go wrong? And the answer is like, I don't know, they flipped the wrong switch or whatever. Uh, because the real answer is because it would be boring if it didn't. So that's what happens, right? right? This is a boring section. They're refueling. So Correct. The They're fuck? refueling. Let's, so let's, let's blow up. Fires get... Right. Let's blow up this place for no reason, right? Or, as you said, uh, sometimes things go wrong because, you know, just asteroids. It's an asteroid. So things are unstable. So that means sometimes we can just blow stuff up whenever and that's how it works. Fine. So... To make that sort of seem together so you're not like, well, you know, so it doesn't feel too convenient, Michael Bay starts basically cutting rapidly between contrasting motions so that we get disoriented. So this is a Mm. refresher for everybody. So usually if you want the audience to be like sort of swept into something, you're going to use like sort of similar motion, like continuity of motion to Mm. make the audience feel like we're all moving in the same direction. It feels very, uh, very synthesized you know like it uh, like it's it's all working cohesive yeah cohesive that's the word i was looking for thank you um michael bay is going to use opposite moving things so that we feel like we don't know exactly where we are and therefore feel like danger right and we feel like physically like, uh, uncomfortable like, uh the, the michael bay shot where he like wraps around like think of bad boys or whatever like yes the idea of like one shot is clockwise and it edits with a shot that's counterclockwise and but they're both like moving at you know tremendous speed is that what you mean it's partly that and it's also partly that like we literally have contradictory cuts to warn us that there is danger even though there's no reason visually that we've seen yet for us mm-hmm. to feel that danger for instance uh the first astronaut if you remember very briefly like there's an astronaut that gets clobbered by an asteroid mm-hmm. right so, like, he basically, 
like so he gets clobbered by an asteroid. Apparently he couldn't see that asteroid coming. Okay, fine. Gruber, I uh, think. Is, <laughs> is that his name? Amazing. So yeah. uh once that starts, we get a bunch of 180 steady cam moves on a long lens, right? So 180 right. degree moves on steady cam are they feel very disorienting because if they're on a long lens, because the long lens means we're only seeing a very small selection of uh, the landscape, and it feels like it's whizzing past us really intensely. Right. That's why most Steadicam moves that move 180 are not going to be on the longest lens. They're going to be on a wider lens because it helps us digest more of the landscape. We have more of the landscape. Right. You get more okay. parallax in a way that we understand that's natural to our eye. Right, exactly. So what he does is he puts it on this really long lens, travels like thirty feet in five seconds. Yeah, so right. It, so like like he like right. a huge move. Okay, like really fast. And then we get a bunch of smash cuts. And so what happens is we don't understand mm. screen direction anymore. Yeah, we have no. We don't understand where things like we don't understand geography, where we are, or what's happening. And because of that, uh, we process this tension by uh not by seeing it get resolved but by feeling the resolution through camera movements right it's right neat, so again it's a neat little trick to make you focus on the thing that he doesn't put attention to like a character's face so that the actor can right. do like a compelling performance and you're like oh that is a compelling performance is this movie good like he does that so well you're absolutely yeah. right he's really good at it you never feel like it doesn't hold together it's kind of one of his biggest talents. He's able to throw these things together that feel like they really should like, like be like, ugh, but they work. Mm -hmm. He's really good at that. And again, it trains us not to trust the actual story to resolve or the actual visual elements to resolve, but instead let the camera tell you when the problem is resolved. Right, right. Let the, let the film elements tell you that, right? So like it, he's transferred our connection to emotions purely to his filmmaking and away from the actual elements of the scene. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, this is a tactic that he uses almost exclusively when he's dealing with the asteroid. Yeah, okay. Well, so yeah. like he, he uses for instance on all the time on this mismatch speed. Mm -hmm. There's like speed mismatching all the time there. Like where some people are in like extremely slow motion. Other people are reacting in real time or even slightly faster motion and it's not for poetic reasons. It's just to make the tension go up. Right? So, like, for instance, Bruce Willis' character is moving at, like, quarter speed during the countdown to blow up the nuke. And everyone else is reacting in right. real time. Right. You know? Uh, yeah. Because yeah, if you show this events in real time, it's not interesting. Right. Okay? But, but the one-sided... And you don't see this that much, actually. The one-sided slowdown does work because we're disoriented so much that we're not even thinking about the fact like we're, we're disoriented in terms of like screen direction and speed and everything else. We're not thinking about the fact that they're not moving the same speed, but they're not, you know, it shouldn't match. Uh, and so the point of this, in my opinion, and he uses it a lot on the asteroid for this reason is it help It keeps us from getting a sense of the geography of the asteroid. Right. Like I don't, he does not want us to know how the asteroid looks, like where things are on the asteroid and like how many feet Relative is this plateau they're on. Geography. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He doesn't want you to understand how the landscape of this place works. Right. Because, and I, this is because, this is because I think he knows that if we start feeling like the asteroid is a set, we're going to think it's stupid. You know, I think he knows that instinctively. Knows like if you understand, instinctively, yeah, you're right. Yeah, it's gonna be dumb. It's gonna Which feel like a dumb '60s space set. Very, you know, that's very astute of him. Yeah, he's really smart like that. He's like, no, 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 you know, because if they know where they are, it's gonna feel like Star Trek or something. And not in a bad, not in the sense that Star Trek is bad, but in the sense that Star Trek feels like fake sci-fi, like like old school Star Trek, like the first show Star Trek. You know, that's gonna feel dumb. So instead, he never gives us geography, mm -hmm. right? Um. So, uh, basically, like, how can I say this simpler? Basically, Michael Bay refuses to let you see the asteroid. Like, you really don't get to see it very clearly. Like, you never get to comprehend it, right? And uh -huh. the, this is why, yeah, and he does that because of this problem and also because it lets him do stuff like things can just blow up at random, creating new moments of tension so that we can string out the drama of this thing. Otherwise, we'd be sitting there watching these guys drill. 
right? So, right, and I think right. that's it would just be like, we got there on the depths. Good job, Chen. <laughs> you know, right. like we I... did it. All right, back in the pod. Right, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Now contrast this with Roland Emmerich. Roland Emmerich, one of his great gifts, I would say, is being able to do geography at scale. He's really good at that, right? So, like when you're when like you know, for instance, at, at, in Day After Tomorrow, you know exactly where Jake Gyllenhaal and his girlfriend are in New York as and in proximity to the flood the entire time that sequence is going down. Right, he has very careful geography, so you know exactly where the flood is. You know exactly where they are. You know where safety is, how far away they are, and you can see the you know the oceans coming to get them. Right, Michael Bay is like, no, 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 you're not going to get any of that. Right, instead, you're never going to know where the where the flood is coming from. It's going to happen when I say it happens, and you're going to, and therefore the the drama will. You'll never feel certain here. You'll always feel like, God, when are we going to be able to get off this asteroid? Because uh, it's a it's a it's a wild card. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you never you can't expect it to do anything logical, right? right and it's right, kind of right, brilliant. Right, right. Yeah, it's kind of brilliant. In it creates its own tension. Way I think you're yeah, yeah I think you're making the point. Yes. So okay, the last way that I want to talk about that Michael Bay tackles these problems is with what I'm going to call sort of bald faced bombast. Okay. Yeah. yeah exactly. Now, right. and, like and, like it takes a certain amount of like shamelessness to do what he does. And I'm not here to like pretend I'm morally superior to him. It's not that Mm -hmm. it's that like as a filmmaker, I think you, you think of yourself, whether you are or not as artistic. Right. So like, and you, and you think of yourself as like, I don't want to repeat or cop to standard tropes. I want to move away from those things and like, you know, tell a story that's unique and original and like, you know, shows my voice and all these things. Right. Like that's what a filmmaker is. Bay Michael Bay has moved far beyond that. Michael Bay is at a point where he feels he's not afraid to use even the most transparent schlock mm. to give you the emotion that he wants to give you. Okay, now I'll say that's often where his misogynistic impulses come from, right? So, like, if you see, like, this film had a couple really misogynistic scenes that were like, "Whoa," right? And why <laughs> yeah. were they there? And they're, why were they yeah, there? They're famous. They're famous. Yeah. Yeah. And, and why were they there? They're there for jokes. They're there for they're, comedy, they're, right? Because he, yeah, he, yeah, he thinks it, this he is thinks America. we need a joke here. Yes. He's like, ah, he, sometimes America's ugly and ar- uh, archetypal, archetypal. Uh, and by archetypal, he really means stereotypical, like in the way that he sees the world, which is, you know, whatever it is. But like, you're absolutely right. He's using it to connect with the audience in a way. With some right. of the audience. Or because he, again, because in his restless feel, like his restless sensibility says, I don't care if it's a cheap laugh or a cheap boner or a cheap boom. Like, I'll use a shitty husband-wife fight at a telescope to get a laugh out of this, like, oh book. my God, get there's an book. asteroid. Yeah, yeah, he's just yelling. Or, yeah, yeah, I'll use the Russian astronaut shoving the American woman aside. Oh, Peter to hit is yeah. so good. <laughs> he's good, but that that's horrific because he's like literally just going to beat the ship of the wrench. Why? Yeah. Jokes. Right. Jokes. I'm surprised you know? he wasn't drinking vodka. You know what I mean? Right, right. And like this is where he often gets most deeply criticized because he's willing to tap into something very ugly for a base laugh. And I totally agree with those criticisms. Right. Like I think, yeah, man, you shouldn't do that. You know, like you shouldn't do that. And I don't I'm I uh I don't want to say more about it because I think we could get into a whole there could be a whole other conversation about, you know, what do you I do with the misogyny of these films? Honestly has been had a lot. Uh I think that <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it hasn't. Like I always, I always lose my own kind of like read on things. Like it's almost to me saying that he is like his politics or his, uh, you know, like his sympathies are outdated and problematic at the least is like an old hat at this point. Like it's like, yeah, agreed. No, duh. You know. Yeah, we all know that. Right, right. And that's I don't. That's why I don't feel like I need to. You don't need you know, to like yeah. Really. Uh, ham- hammer on it. It does deserve its own conversation, Absolutely. both for the consequences and also for what does it say about storytelling that we use this convention, like the, like that, we use misogyny the at these conventions. Conversation is what does it matter yeah. to the whole, and that yeah, it, that is a good that is a good conversation. For our purposes, it serves 
like I'm talking about just how is he deploying this to give us a, a blockbuster experience? Mm. This is what it means. Uh, for our purposes, it the the obtuseness that he is willing to embrace that obtuseness that with which he's willing to embrace this bombast or bravado mm. over logic basically wears down your critique faculty. You know what I mean? Like your, your willingness to critique the movie is eroded over time because right. he's shotgunning you with yeah. this stuff. That's like pure schlock, right? Like having an argument with a tantrum. Exactly. Part of the reason why we have this hour long training montage, a thing that could have been cut. Like you basically could have cut most of that. Mm-hmm. You know? Like the movie is two and a half hours. Like you could have cut ninety nine percent of that because we didn't learn anything. Mm-hmm. But the reason we have it there is because I think Michael Bay is using it to sort of train us for yes. here's how the tone's gonna work, yeah. here's how the jokes are gonna work, here's how the tension's gonna work. That's the and you're gonna shit. feel this way. Yeah. yeah. It's a it's we're being trained in the training montage. Uh-huh. Right, like you're gonna get jokes every three seconds. Some of them are gonna be groaners. Some of them are gonna be actually funny. Doesn't matter. You need a joke. Uh, Bashemi is gonna be a complete nightmare. Why? Because you need that character. Uh, things Which are gonna you don't, explode. But he's training you. To but think he thinks you do, you do. Yeah. exactly Just because he's established that rhythm. And you're like, okay, I, I understand. Uh, he's gonna make things explode for reasons you don't understand. It doesn't matter. We're in space, motherfuckers. That's how it's gonna work, yeah. right? I'm gonna and just also, turn it on at random times. Yeah, yeah, he's gonna throw TNA in your face sometimes, right? Hey, you're bored. Here's here's a boob. Here's a butt. <laughs> Seriously, he's gonna yeah, shove it does. right in your eyes. Like he we don't need it sure in this PG-13 does. movie. We don't yeah. need it. But he's gonna stick it there. Why? Because he never wants you to stop and think about the story. He never wants to slow down. He never wants to let off the gas. Mm-hmm. He wants you to have as mu- like maximum fun, mm-hmm. right? And the truth of the matter is, for the most movie going audience, especially in 1998, this was maximum fun. And right? I also like, want to yeah. add, yeah, please, in the Criterion Collection. <laughs> I know. I mean, and I think there's a reason why it's in the criteria because collection. it reflects uh, American cultural values. That's uh, that's a very good reason. Also, because despite its narrative being very poor, the filmmaking is very good. It, you know, like it, there- it created a moment where everyone was like, "You seen Armageddon?" Uh, like that one time that everyone was like, "You seen Passion of the Christ?" Oh my god! Uh, I, I love know, right? films that like become like a uh, like bigger than the box office. Um, that's you know, in this in in this world of show, uh, <laughs> that's what we're all <laughs> here for. Uh, you know, it's it's nonsense, but it's our nonsense. It's human nonsense, right? Right. So, I mean, I think the best way to summarize this argument in general is that Michael Bay. Is a is the only guy with the visual and storytelling sensibility, mm-hmm. and the lack of idealism as about film in general, like just no film ideals, and like he so that makes him basically the only guy who could have directed Armageddon, like just nobody else could do it. He has this unique like mix of things, mm-hmm. um, and therefore I think you know love him or hate him, you kind of have to acknowledge that his sense of motion and his his very deep and robust understanding about cinematic conventions and editing has made him a success. He is a bankable success. Yeah. Uh, Cause I think he is reflected by the populace is like interest in the thing that he provides. Like he is the perfect, like let's uh, light the fires and kick the tires, you know, right. let's, Bang, 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 bang. He's like a uh, machine gun firing constantly. You can't argue with machine gun firing constantly at you because he's just he's screaming bullets in your face. So I'm sure I like I, I'm sure somebody more more educated in like the history of cinema can point to lots of movies earlier than this one that are examples of time as the director sort of abandoned narrative and moved instead to let's just have fun Mm -hmm. but i feel like michael bay represents that shift in like a wholesale way right like this is i mean this is when film moved that way blockbuster you know which was you know really if we want to get you know specific founded by spielberg 
Right, um, with but, Jaws. But right. mostly it was indicative of a moment of the Arturs taking over the studio's ways of doing things and becoming so making stories that were popular enough. So pulp, anytime we're talking about pulp, that is the motivation. I don't want to do the thing that I'm, I'm tired of these stories that they have determined are, you know, how stories should be done. You know, you can do the same thing to the Academy Awards. We all have the kind of um, observation that we're like, yeah, they made that movie to try to win an Oscar. If you've ever thought that or heard that conversation, that is you reacting to a way in which the you know like hegemony of storytelling is operating and saying i wish for something different so you like the weirder tales so that's like so you think of people right now who are working like james gunn you know you you think of our tours uh working 10 15 years ago like wes anderson who are now that now they're the one the villains uh, so to speak, because they have been on top for a while. We just want new stuff. And he, uh, for a lot of people, I think Michael Bay, that is, uh, offered that. Um, I but think it's he also, I think he also offered film to like for the public in a language that they already had, but had never, but hadn't really been acknowledged that, that seriously from such a big, destination like and that is like sort of enjoying it ironically mm-hmm. you know like i think he's i don't think he's the only one who's ever done that or even the first but i think he's really good at creating movies that people who enjoy movies ironically can love because he's cynical enough that you don't feel he's cynical enough you, and- you don't you don't feel like you're ch- ch- in any way violating the movie to sort of laugh at it no, yeah, you know? not at all. I, I think it should be said that Michael Bay makes movies for a group of people. And that group of people is like white people who love America, right? For the most <laughs> part. That's I, I don't who know. Are I mean, in his he movies. made bad boys. He made bad boys, right? He he's made movies yeah, that are not exa- that's true. just that. Yeah, maybe it's not entirely a white thing, but like it definitely is. Um, and, oh, I, I, no question. I mean, and, the, and the, it's. I guess my my point isn't the whiteness of Michael Bay, but rather like the reason he's quote unquote bankable, as you were mentioning, is because he, the kind of reckoning we have to deal with that sucks. Uh, about Michael Bay is he's not wrong about that. America is that way. And that's the real like sadness <laughs> beneath all this is that for the longest time, America has been that way. So he shamelessly uses I- iconography like the American flag or which you know, he really does in this film. It's salutes, like, wow. Salute. Yeah. Just giving a good old salute. There, there uh, are flags. There are flags in this movie in places that are baffling that there would even be a flag there. Yeah, and it's this all the uh, same to him, or at least it, I perceive it as it's the same as like a, you know, John Deere fucking tractor. Like it's the same, like American flag tractor, whatever. Like to him, that's what it feels like. And I think I think he thinks of it. it seems like, to be right. Well, I think he thinks of it in this like not in like a like I don't think I don't think he holds the same values that he's drawing on. I think he sees the American flag as like a square of feelings that he can stick to <laughs> that he can stick in a frame and it's get what he wants out of the frame. Of I'm serious. I really think That's he so thinks good. that. No, it's right? so good. Like he's not like, man, this really makes me feel patriotic about America. I think he's <laughs> just like, look, I want to get maximum nostalgia out of this. Let's stick a feeling square in there. Yeah, it's absolutely you know? right. It's absolutely That's what right. He, it's That's like what he, does. what he can get out of the uh image. Um and once again, listening to his like uh commentaries the, you're spot on because that's how he talks about it. He talks about like, we went there and we gathered these images because he, t- he talks about it in the way that one who's seeking to make propaganda would talk about assembling the footage in order to create propaganda. And he is prop art. He's, uh, he's, I mean, he, he's like, he's sort of like transgressive as an artist in the way that like, <laughs> you're going to hate this, but I think it's true. 
uh, in the way that like Trump is transgressive as a politician. I because, don't disagree. Yeah. yeah, because like Michael Bay is the guy who's like, I don't care about being uh, liked. I care about uh, creating a thing that's undeniably uh, successful. And I also don't believe in anything, any of the imagery or meanings or uh, feelings that I'm going to create. I just know how to get those feelings and then capitalize on them. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I, that's what I believe about Trump. Like I don't believe he he believes in any of the things he it claims. It takes a lot more, like an uh, like a not an actual artist because I think he is an artist in the absolutely sense of the word. Yeah, but like as someone who actually did care about like patriotism and what it means and like is like looking to see and seek like honest truth in like what is the what why is patriotism a problem? Why is patriotism good? If an artist were to like focus that on his sites he would ask questions and be or she would be willing to put that patriotism and challenge and contest that kind of you know like those i those for example iconography or those kinds of people uh who would say those kinds of things that are said in his movies or just in general like do we salute this kind of thing like he doesn't seem to be he's surface value. Um right. he just goes for like yeah, just that is an uh, that is an unspoken rule that you salute the flag and that is good. Okay. Right. So he's how using, can I use that? He's he's like as aware of the absurdity of image meanings as like an Andy Warhol. Like right, he's, he's that ads. aware. He yeah, he knows that stuff, but he doesn't want to make something that's meaningful with that knowledge, he wants to make something that's successful with that knowledge, Mm -hmm. you know? And like, and so therefore like people who hold art artistry or whatever in a sort, as a sort of like emotional value feel offended by his work, you know? Cause like his work makes offensive work. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. He does. I mean, right. And, And not without cause, but I'm just, I guess I'm just trying to explain what I see as a, um, a methodology, like a modus operandi for him. I, I hope that I'm picking up what you're dropping. I think so. And I'll like sum it up, I guess with this, like he is so inconsistent. He makes a job out of clashing. Like you said, bombastically all these elements, but isn't that what, like the question that I have is that when we think of like what an artist is, it's kind of like this weird catch 22 because I want to hate him. Right. But isn't that what we want out of an artist? Yes. This nitrous right. fueled instinct. Like he's yes. over here saying, I want this speed. I want this cut. Fuck that shot. I'm using this shot. Isn't that what we want? Isn't it arguable? If it's for better or worse, uh, it's definitely in the face, like for better or for worse. And by that, I mean like, it's definitely worse. It's he's Michael Bay. It's definitely worse, but like, it's definitely in the face of choice by committee. Right. And that's what I'm getting to. when I was like, isn't that what we want? Like no defense of his politics or sympathies. He's undeniably singular in his craftsmanship. Yep. And he's I- repeatably bankable. So is that not proof enough that that is what we want out artists? And like, I think that he is a artist for some people. Like he is the perfect artist for some people. I, I think he's, I think the he's best Thomas thing you can, can say about an artist. He, right? he, he's Thomas Kincaid. I mean, that's what he is. It, like he's I, yeah. Like, in you a know, sense. Yeah. We're all kind of Thomas Kincaid in a sense. Right. In that I, I, <laughs> like, like it joking about Thomas you. Kincaid aside, Right. Like the guy paints a nice lighthouse, you know what I mean? Like his lighthouse yeah. is nice. Right. So like, uh, like, nice. and I think Michael Bay, Michael Bay is as skilled at his craft as any director I can think of. That's mm-hmm. not, you know, there's a few names that no, he's not that good, but like he's as skilled at his craft. Right. I think the reason we viscerally react to it so much is that like, he it's is not for you. Why? Well, like he doesn't hold storytelling and film sacred. Like he doesn't think of right. these things That's as why as sacred it, art he's forms. He's not for me at all. Like on right. top of all the problematic shit, which is kind of number one for me. Which that and it should like be. his Romeo and Juliet law is still my favorite in Transformers. 
you know. What's um, the romance? What? Uh, Sorry, he has an that. insert. I, I'm surprised uh, you don't know that by name. It's like it's kind of like in this movie, Animal Crackers. Like they, he right. has a history of like <laughs> we we have a shorthand in film classes about right. scenes that he does because they're so like this actually feels like a like 1984 at this point like this is a joke right um and so yeah romeo and juliet law is a uh, reference to in transformers i don't know 19 uh he has uh marky mark has a daughter who's like 17 or whatever i didn't i never saw and this there's one. a law in texas i i'm probably bastardizing oh, everything no no i do remember this no please that it's go ahead. like go ahead. yeah and i don't even know what the law is but more or less i think the law is something like it's not statutory rape if it's like uh if they're both under 18 right or something like that i forget what it is but like, i i yeah and uh, it's we should look this up i'm gonna look this up yeah i uh, want to see what the actual law is but like the whole point of it is that like michael bay chooses to shoot an insert of like there's a guy carrying a card like an id card or your money uh to prove to marky mark that he's like no actually there's a law that says that this because like marky mark's like you trying to fuck my daughter you know like he's like, oh right yeah and he's like it's- oh, he put you in jail and like uh and the, the kid is like uh no actually sir this is a uh, law and it's fine and it's like, why would Michael Bay, 50-year-old Michael here. Bay, go? Well, first <laughs> off, yeah. Why would this scenario occur? Like, right, why right, would right. this person do this thing? That's not even my big question. That's just a good question. The right. real question is, why would Michael Bay, a 50-year-old man, <laughs> put this in his movie and, like, focus on an insert for so yeah, long? Yeah, you're right. That that really is... Uh, it's indicative. It's telling it, on himself. Yeah, it, that really is. That's unforgivable. Yeah, like, ah, yeah. So yeah, I'm okay goes, when I show the fucking yeah. Look at the asses, ah, Michael Bay. And right. That's like oh that does God. go beyond. That does go beyond capitalizing on a base instinct for the tone of your movie into yes, I really want to make stuff about this. And I think that, so, that that's we're taking two photos of him as an artist and him as right. development as an artist. Uh, I think he got a little bit confident. Doesn't mean that he didn't hold these beliefs during Armageddon or The Rock a few years previous. Could be, uh, yeah. But Could be. like, you know, it tells you where it tells you where he's coming from, and um, I uh, I completely forgot <laughs> that where this existed. Coming. Yeah, I completely forgot this existed. So let me just like uh, state again for the record. Uh, okay, so his misogyny is much worse than even I yeah. depicted it here. <laughs> yeah, thank you for exactly. thank you for reminding me of that. Uh, yeah, it yeah, is yeah. that is unacceptable. He's like, uh, I also, want an excuse to show Megan Fox all the right, time. Right, and and those stories and are known. I'm and, angry that people are angry at me. He's a little child. It's petulance. Yeah, right. Like, see, I, yeah, I've totally forgot about this. <laughs> right, so it, it's it's that's real bad. That's but that's you're, really you're not really wrong really bad. About he does like like the patriotism stuff. Like he, he's st- there are things he focuses on that are seemingly more just like base element. That maybe there's nothing like vindictive or like salacious about yeah, it. It's just cynical, right? Like it's, it's ju- just cynical. yeah, it's just kind of cynical, and that yeah like, now isn't now fine. I've... It's it, it's definitely irresponsible, but it's not like well condemning condemning like i don't know this is this is condemning to me uh uh i don't i mean i don't see a lot of filmmakers intentionally putting statutory rape cards on their film nope, that's pretty that's, wild that's the thing so like but i think that probably it's the success of his films doesn't to me indicate that america thinks like pedophilia is good really we just don't want to say that nah I think it's more that like we're putting up with this thing about his films because yeah. he's so good at the rest of what he does that we, I think he's definitely yeah. losing most of the room when he's doing that shit. That's why yeah. I think he was like overconfident yeah. and feels like I'm Michael Bay, I can do whatever. Uh yeah. when he's making Armageddon, he's less like I can do whatever. But he always, always but, was kind of but very I, I think arrogant. Armageddon it, yes, he was. I think Armageddon is kind of like his peak in terms of influence on cinema like like uh i mean he's done a bunch of movies since but i think, I think right. 
He made yeah. Transformers. That was a big hit. And then he just started making only Transformers and Ninja Turtles for a pretty long time. No, it's like The Rock in this. And this yeah. is the bigger yes. one. And Bad um, Boys. Those are the and three Bad Boys. Like, Bad big, Boys big ones. was also like, I mean, Bad Boys was just so seminal in terms of him. But also just like action movies, it was it was so early that it kind of blindsided everyone. But like w- terms of Michael Bay becoming an artist, I think The Rock is where he hit his stride, and I think Armageddon is his like perfection of the thing. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a pretty yeah. I think that's I, I think that's right on. And Armageddon is seems to me when I look at it to be like him sort of flexing and saying like. Like hold my beer. This is like a hold my beer movie for Michael Bay. I think kind of, yeah. You know where it, where he yeah. like he took on something that was much dumber than I think any of the rest Man. of his premises, and really, really delivered from uh, it, from a directorial standpoint. Again, not watch, a good movie. You every know, time like, I watch this movie, man, the um, as you were saying, which I want you to say again because it was off mic. I think uh, he's editing. Yeah, he so he, fast. he was ahead of the curve on editing. I um, think you're I right. think he yeah. like so like I remember for instance there was that argument about uh Britney Spears's I, I think it was Oops I Did It Again where it was like oh my god there was like 2000 cuts in that in that like that was oh, like the a Walter Murch in a blink yes, of an eye. Yes, in the blink of an eye he to, makes yes. Yeah, 300 but, some cuts. Yeah. But really it's Michael Bay that kind of started that movement in cinema of like the frantic sort of mismatching cuts and seeming things together. Michael Bay has a really strong sense of editing. And I don't mean that like, like a lot of people I think perceive his editing choices as being like, uh, like sort of shotgun blast. Like he's sort of snipping things together. Yeah. But like, if you've directed anything of any size, one thing you know is that like, you can see when somebody is editing artistically um, and creatively, and when somebody's editing to salvage a bad scene, you know, like, mm-hmm. uh, for, like for instance, the movie you're going to talk about next, there's some editing to save a bad scene in it a little bit. Um, this movie, he doesn't. I, I really think he shot for these frantic edits, and they seemed and they cut together because he understands how to make that work. Um, and that takes a lot of talent, man. Like shooting for the edit is one of the great director skills um, that's sort of underappreciated. Uh, and I think Michael Bay has that more than maybe anybody, you know, like, yeah. I, I don't know who has it better than him. Like I would say even Spielberg sort of shoots his movies so that they snap together. You know, like I, like I, when I watch a Spielberg film, I feel like every single piece of it feels very designed. Like, I don't feel like he is shooting a bunch of moving parts and then seaming them together and editing. Um, which is like, say the opposite of like, say a Terrence Malick, when you watch a Terrence Malick film, you're, you know, you're watching a guy who's shot a bunch of stuff and then he's kind of finding a story mm. in the edit. I think that Michael Bay is a perfect fusion of those two things. I think he's designed his film to such a degree that he can sort of shotgun blast his shots on mo- like in movement and know they're going to still snap together. And that's amazing to me. Like the frantic fury of it. It's amazing. I find that very impressive. It's yeah, it's definitely unique to him and it's definitely effective on a lot of us uh, definitely was effective on me. The first time I saw Armageddon again, think about it. This is a fucking almost three hour movie. It's two and a half hours and it feels like it snaps right by. I just sat in the theater for no time to die. That bond film. And mm-hmm. I'm going to complain about it everywhere. Cause it was two hours and 43 minutes and it was an eternity. <laughs> it, it was an eternity and it had all kinds of really cool scenes in it. And I liked Daniel Craig and I liked the director, but like, <laughs> I'm not saying Michael Bay would have made it better, but if there had been a Michael Bay style edit of that film, it would have felt good. <laughs> you know, like he's really good at that. Well, uh, yeah, we did it. Yeah, we did it. We did it, man. We did it. Uh, I'm, thank you, you for did it. Yeah. Thank you for uh, bringing up the Romeo and Juliet card. I, I, I'm glad you said that because I had forgotten about that. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think it's, that's uh, that's deserves to be acknowledged anytime we talk about. Yeah, uh, it's Mike, one of those Michael things Bay. that goes on your permanent record, I think. <laughs> well, I mean, especially because, like, you know, as much as I'm trying to describe it only in terms of effect on the audience, I mean, he's still shooting yeah. these young women this way. It's, like, completely unacceptable. Yeah, yeah, he took a doo-doo yeah. in the street, and we all get to bring up the doo-doo. That's right. Uh, and he won't, talk he, about him. he won't acknowledge it either. Like, he doesn't acknowledge it. 
Oh, he's yeah, because you know? he knows. He knows. He fucking knows. He's savvy. He knows yeah. the sympathies of the American public hold like a little it'll hold his reputation like a little baby bird in his hand in their hands. What he would, knows he he's got masters. What would you do if you found out that he made an independent film? Would you watch that film? Are you like, like I a, do like a student like he did it in a uh, pseudonym? Like he had a Well th- that'd be amazing. Like, that'd like be amazing. He, <laughs> like he's like <laughs> Like he makes like a twenty four some shit. Yeah. Like he, let's say Todd uh, Lagoon. Todd Lagoon. Yeah, I'm trying to think of the, direct, like... the director of the Green Knight, and he's just like, and he's just like the first junket. He just walks out, and is like, "What is Michael Bay doing here?" He's like, "Surprise, motherfuckers! I made the Green Knight. <laughs> I'm like, Todd what? Lagoon. <laughs> that doesn't even make sense." That, well, what? I, I, I don't even think of the Green Knight as being an independent film in the same way, but that is amazing. No, but that would like I want something where it's like got the. Uh, you know, pastiche of like, uh, yes. I'm an art tour yes. of a different kind. Agreed. Because like a 24 is if there's anyone who's going to like slap in the face of Michael Bay, it's a 24 because they're like, ma- they're, they've made a corporation out of the yeah. idea of being like, we're alternative reality. We're alternative. Uh, you know, like we're, we're a different form of copium. <laughs> you know? the, well, they, uh, they represent the other end of the spectrum. We make yeah, exactly. movies that are substantial and uh, that we are want not big substance budget. only. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We want characters. We want yeah. all that stuff. So it's just funny to me. Anyway, but, yeah, I'm getting off topic. That would be really fucking funny. Uh, this is, yeah, I, I, I do love looking at the undercarriage of America, the CD <laughs> kind of, <laughs> genitalia of america there really and that's is. what michael bay offers is like let's see what god's up to every time i turn on one of his movies i'm like all right what is what works in this country in the last several decades i mean it, that's true but let's not forget that it he still has a mastery of how to that's yeah obfuscate things that normally work in other films Dude, for his Sousa purposes could make the shit out of a march i'm not yep. gonna deny yeah, yeah. that That's some right. musicians some artists are just fucking knocking out bangers left That's and right. right doesn't change the nature of the the, the beast that's valid uh, yeah good point that's a good but point. yeah i okay. like your deconstruction and i think that's that's a episode, right? Unless I think you so. Have any final thoughts? I think so. Like all I can say is, uh, for those of you who go back and watch Armageddon, <laughs> if you want to learn something about film, not necessarily have a good time, learn something about film. Watch mm-hmm. the core right after, because you will oh, yeah. you will appreciate uh, the talent of Michael Bay. After that, you yeah, may not it's like a the contrast, man, yeah. but you will appreciate it. Because he he's a much Whew, better filmmaker. Two yeah. different ways of looking at the same problem. Same and problem. One is exactly. a lot better. Much much better. Thank all you, right. sir, for your all your help along the way. Hey, man, I appreciate you. Appreciate you. This has been a Small Beans Endeavor. We're a bunch of pals who make podcasts, sketches, music, web series, and movies. The Beans always have new ideas percolating, so make sure to check us out at patreon.com slash smallbeans. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash smallbeans, where you can browse all of our current and past content, see what we've got planned in the future, and learn how your support can help the Small Beans grow into huge, giant monster beans. If you enjoyed this content module, please like, rate, subscribe, or tell a friend about us. We love you!